Hello and welcome to this video on making plum wine. A plum wine is both a ubiquitous and sometimes poorly regarded version of wine. It has a reputation for being that thing your grandfather, uncle or estranged relative makes with a high proof and a terrible hangover. In other cases it's a well regarded family practice that is done annually as a sort of bonding activity and enjoyed by all. Now, whichever it is that takes your fancy, hopefully this video will make your plum wine easier to produce and more enjoyable to drink. On its surface, a plum wine is similar to things like cider and perry, which are respectively made from apples and pears. Unlike cider and perry, a plum wine is typically made with additional sugar. This raises the alcohol concentration into range typically considered a wine, hence the name. You can make it using just plums, but beware, it doesn't work quite as well in our experience, so we'll assume a recipe based on sugar, but you can forgo this if you are so inclined. First, you'll need your plums. You'll want about 500 grams, or about 1 pound of plums, for every litre of fermentation you want to make. Note that this is before any processing is done. You'll want about 2 parts, or roughly 300 grams of sugar, for every part or 500 grams of plums you're going to be using. Of course, you'll also need a yeast culture. We do suggest a wine yeast, but if storing the fermentation for a long time, you consider a lager yeast, or you may also want to consider a ale yeast if you're going to treat this more like a barley wine. Typically, you want a wine yeast though. The other options are only really there if wine yeast is just not available. You'll also want roughly twice the weight in water as you have fruit. In this case, if we use 500 grams of plums, it'd be 1 kilogram or 1 litre of water. If we're making this in a demijohn, it'd be about 4 litres of water. If we're going to make this in a standard fermenter, it's about 20 litres of water. Some recipes may also encourage you to use things like Campton tablets, yeast, nutrient, pectin enzymes, and similar. Now, for the most part, we don't necessarily think they're needed to start with, but something like Canton tablets may prove useful once you've bottled the wine into individual bottles and you find that there's a particular off flavor. It might help in clearing that, but for the most part, if we're talking about whole fruit, yeast nutrient isn't needed, and neither would pectin enzymes. For equipment, you'll need an appropriate fermenting vessel. This can be as simple as a mason jar, slightly more advanced with a demijohn or a full-sized fermenter. We strongly suggest a wide mouth fermenting vessel for our method, as we'll make things much easier. But if you choose a demijohn or similar, just note you'll need to adjust the method as we described later. You need an airlock, funnel, and similar kitchen implements such as spoons to stir with. Start by taking your plums and thoroughly rinsing them in clean water. This is not necessary if you're going to peel the plums, which we suggest, but if you choose to use them just as a whole plum, do rinse them. And this is also particularly important if you're using the whole plum with skin on and you're adding it directly into your batch and you have any concerns about it. Now you have your plums all cleaned and ready to go. Remove the core or seed from the plums. This is for two reasons. The first is that it contains amygdalin, which if you uh, use enough plums, is poisonous, which, if you aren't aware, is bad. The other reason is that it adds pectin, and this can lead to the generation of methanol. Methanol's also bad. It's bad because it causes blindness, if you're lucky, and if you're not lucky, well, death. With your plums ideally peeled and cored, you can now start to put them in your fermenter. This is where and why we suggest a wide mouth fermenter. If you use something like this, you can just drop them in, and that's it. No worries, no extra work, it's simple. If, however, you're using a mason jar, a demijohn, or similar, with a more narrow opening, you could squeeze the plums in one by one. It's tedious, it takes a long time, and the problem is, you have to get them out at the end. And that's easier said than done, by a very large margin. For this reason, you can either cook the plums on your stove in a saucepan with some water and the sugar, or something similar. What you're basically doing is creating a concentrate or a cordial that you then use as the plum flavoring and sugar source for the wine itself. It's basically making a juice, but you're making it with sugar alongside the actual juice of the fruit. To some extent, we do suggest heating if you're not going to completely boil your sugar to some extent, particularly if you have any concerns about its safety and sterility. 
The same thing with the plums as well for that matter. If you have any questions about the quality of your plums, it's a good idea to sterilize them this way. But for most people, this shouldn't be a major worry. With your plums added to the fermenting vessel or plum concentrate, take your sugar and add this as well, or in the case of the concentrate, your remaining sugar. Now mix the plums and sugar together thoroughly. If you plan ahead and better than we do, consider either adding layers of plums and then sugar, followed by more plums and sugar until it's all used, or mixing it separately beforehand. And finally, add your yeast. This has everything needed for the plum wine to be made, but it will be slow and possibly very strong. This is also when you can and generally should add your water. Depending on your wishes, this can be made up to anywhere between 4 and 5 litres in a demijohn, or equivalent ratios for a larger and smaller vessel. Now, you don't have to do this. If you want an all-natural, so to say, a plum wine, you can rely just on the juice or the plums themselves. We do suggest adding the water for a few reasons, one of which is simply that it's a larger volume and it helps with the production of ethanol. It means the yeast can tolerate it for longer. The second is that a plum wine is typically quite strong, and so diluting it down beforehand makes it a little bit easier to drink, and it also helps with a few other chemical reactions along the way when you are aging it. The other thing here is it's a very good idea to now measure the specific gravity of your sugar concentration in your plum wine. Now you can either do specific gravity, the bricks, or whichever it is you prefer to use, but doing it at this stage will tell you, once you go to bottle it, just how much of the sugar has been converted into alcohol, ideally anyway. With it all measured, everything set to ferment, seal your fermenter with an airlock, bung, and a weight. And typically, due to the relatively simple sugars and reasonably high dose of yeast, your plum wine will take between one and two weeks to ferment. In colder conditions, it can be up to a month, and in warmer conditions, it can be considerably faster. However, caution should be taken when making plum wine under warm conditions. That's because it typically leads to a lower quality wine and a higher probability of generating methanol. Again, methanol being bad. After the fermentation stops bubbling in your airlock, leave the wine to settle for several weeks. Now, this will remove most, if not all, of the plum solids from the fermentation, or at least the larger solids. And now you can look at transferring the content in clean bottles for storage and aging. At its simplest, you can just pour off the top of the plum wine through a funnel with a filter in it. This should mostly leave the solids in the original fermenter, or they are caught in the filter. That means you should get a fairly comprehensive and reasonably clean wine out of this. A little more advanced is to use a siphon, or a little more advanced again, a bottling wand. After this, you have several choices, the choices being drink now, and drink soon, or drink later. Each has its merits and demerits. As a general rule with all wine, a later is better, at least in broad terms. The longer it ages, the more dry it will be to an extent. Also, the more balanced the flavour will be as it's had more time to react and all of the off flavours to basically be smothered. Noting that this is a wine also, so it's not carbonated, you don't need to worry about the issue of carbonation and bottles bursting, assuming you've not managed to make some terrible mistake. This choice is also arguably the longest, as it takes up to a year and sometimes even more, which is very clearly, depending on how much you want to try this, a big demerit. Now, the middle ground is not as good in terms of balanced flavour, but you get the best compromise between waiting and enjoyment. The time required is anywhere up to 6 months and sometimes longer, most often a little bit less. The final choice is about a month after bottling, and arguably this is the worst choice. You get some balancing of the flavours and the aromas, but it really has nowhere near settled. As a result, it's quite rough still, and it's one of the reasons why plum wine has a bad reputation. The benefit though is you do get to start enjoying it much sooner. Now. Enjoying, depending on how rough it is, may be a bit of an overstatement, but that assumes you're after the flavour and not the alcohol. There is one, let's say, a solution to this problem, and it's a large batch of fermentations, such as those at 25 litres or more. This choice is not really a problem, let's say, for when you want to start drinking, as you can literally make enough and bottle it that you can store enough of this for up to a year, assuming you don't consume more than one litre a week. This allows you to see the development of the flavour over time. The advantages to doing so are pretty obvious, that is you have access to your wine almost immediately, but the other benefit is that you can figure out 
first of all, when the wine gets to a point where you actually have to start drinking it, but if you're happy to keep waiting, just when the flavor begins to plateau, that is, when do you reach the point at which you're just going to get diminishing returns by waiting any further? Some final notes on the end result in flavor. Our recipe is definitely on the dry side of things. That means it's not very sweet. If you want a more sweet wine, you can either increase the plums, the sugar, or both. Uh, that'll make the plum wine sweeter and shouldn't overly increase the fermentation time as the yeast will eventually hit a limit on how much ethanol it can tolerate and therefore it will stop fermenting. Next is your choice of plum. Now first of all we add the colour of the plum flesh and juice. This will ultimately dictate your plum wine colour. The darker the flesh and juice, the darker the plum wine. You can dilute it down to some extent and therefore make a more pale plum wine and this is similar in a way to House Air Rosé is made from a red wine and a white wine, or Budweiser which is diluted with beer. The other is noting that the actual variety of plum you use can have a direct effect on the flavour. Now some of them are, let's say, uh, more bitter, more sweet, uh, more pronounced, all sorts of things can come into play. So your local variety of plum can have a significant effect on the flavour of your plum wine in the end. In other things related to flavour, you can go beyond just plums in your wine. Whether you add these before fermentation or during aging is your choice, but the addition of dried herbs such as cinnamon, cloves, star anise and more do add nice flavours and work quite well. If you don't want to take this approach and effectively uh, spike the entire batch with these flavours, you can instead choose to make something more akin to mulled wine, and you do this simply by following a standard mulled wine recipe but you use plum wine instead of red wine. And this is how you make your plum wine, or something we should call plum wine, if only because of the sugar concentrations and the consequential alcohol concentration. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. And please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.